I am a professor at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, and I've been working on developing various uh, uh, software tools for synthetic biology and genetic design and modeling um, for over about 18 years now. And before I start talking about genetic design tools, I first wanted to step back and talk a little bit about data standards. A somewhat more sophisticated standard is the GenBank data standard, which allows you to not only indicate what your DNA sequence is, but also to annotate where you might find some interesting components within that sequence. So you can indicate, for example, where the promoter is, the ribosome binding site, coding sequence, et cetera. Both of these data standards, however, were developed during the DNA read era when we were more interested in looking at natural systems and DNA sequences that we could find there. Um, as you're all aware that we've entered the DNA write era where synthetic biology is taking a leading role. In this area of work, what we're doing is designing new DNA sequences, as I'm sure you're all aware. And then when you're doing design, it's very different than if you're just reading a natural sequence. So to address this difference, um, some, a community developed to develop the Synthetic Biology Open Language, or ESPL, uh, which we've been heavily involved in for uh, over 10 years now. And in this data standard, you can describe your, um, the same sort of things, like you can describe your genetic parts, like promoters and ribosome binding sites and coding sequences, et cetera. But the difference is that you don't have to provide the sequence for all the parts, because as you're doing a genetic design, you may not yet know what your DNA part sequences are gonna be. You just might know that I have one, a promoter, followed by a ribosome binding site, then a coding sequence and a terminator. You might have sequences for some of them, like the, the promoter and the coding sequence, but you haven't yet decided which ribosome binding site or terminator you want to use. Also, you wanna build up your designs hierarchically when you're doing design. And this is kind of like what you'll be doing with um, BioBricks in the iGEM competition, is that you have basic BioBricks and you put them together for composite BioBricks to build up um, higher and higher level complexity within your designs. Um, that was ESPL version one and ESPL version two, we added the ability to express other types of components, not just DNA components, because in a genetic design, you'll have things like small molecules and proteins that are part of your design as well. And we wanna indicate things like um, this small molecule represses this protein or this coding sequence codes for this protein, which then is used to repress this promoter. Um, so the ESPL data standard is actually two standards. There's the standard for representing the low level details, the, the genetic design information, uh, which is the data standard. And it's also a visualization standard. When you pick up um, various articles and look at them to describe different uh, genetic designs within synthetic biology, they often will use different types of uh, figure um, or glyphs to represent different parts. ESPL tries to standardize that so that whenever you see a promoter, it's always this bent arrow. Whenever you see a coding sequence, it's this sort of uh, box with an arrow um, shape. And then a ribosome binding site is a half circle and a terminator is this T. And we have various other glyphs for a lot of other components you will see in your designs. ESPL is supported by a lot of different academic and industrial uh, and government research uh, foundations. And interestingly, very recently, we've also formed an industrial consortium where industrial partners have joined with us to uh, help in the development of ESPL and provided some support for doing so. And you'll see that some of the partners that you also will be working with in iGEM, such as IDT, uh, TWIST, and others are also partners within the ESPL effort. One of the things that we're excited about with ESPL is the ACS Synthetic Biology Journal, one of the um, forefront journals for synthetic biology, has recommended the use of ESPL for giving uh, visual descriptions as well as digital transmission of genetic design information. So if you're an author of a paper for the ACS Synthetic Biology, um, the way this would work is you're sitting here and you've got your design and you've written your article and then your genetic design you would build using a genetic design automation tool, such as the ones I'll be describing during this webinar. And then you could export that design using one of the data standards I mentioned, such as GenBank, FASTA, or ESPL. Um, and then we have converters that will convert from um, the other standards, such as GenBank and FASTA, into an ESPL file that you can then upload to a data repository. You could also have an ESPL visual representation that you can put in your article. And then when you download um, the article, you could have not just the article itself, but also the, all the DNA sequences and other genetic information about your design available to you. A key aspect of this workflow, though, is you need good genetic design automation tools for developing your designs. 
Uh, fortunately, a lot of genetic design automation tools have been uh, developed over the years. This is um, just a short list of some of the tools that are available that support the ESPL data standard. And I'm going to talk briefly about just some of those tools. And those tools can be grouped into three categories. We have data repositories where you can get genetic design information. We have sequence editors where you can build up genetic circuits out of these genetic parts you can find in these data repositories. And then we have circuit design tools where you can do things like modeling and simulation. And then we can take everything that you've done and you can upload your designs back into these data repositories to share with other researchers. And this data standard that I've mentioned, ESPL, is what powers all of this to go, go on. <clears throat> so the first category of um, genetic design tools that I want to tell you about are data repositories. Uh, one of the data repositories that's out there is called ICE, which is developed by the Joint Bioenergy Institute. And in this data repository, you can provide things like information about various plasmids and strains that you're using within your genetic design. Another data repository is useful for metabolic design. This is called ESPL-ME. Um, in the ESPL-ME data repository, you have um, incorporated the entire CAG database represented in the ESPL data standard. So this includes things like uh, chemical compounds, enzymes, metabolic reactions, proteins, and organisms. Another data repository that hopefully you're all familiar with or getting familiar with is the iGEM registry of standard biological parts, um, which is the core registry where people within the iGEM competition um, share their information. So the iGEM registry itself doesn't support the ESPL data standard, but one thing that we've done in our group is we've actually taken the entire iGEM registry data and we've converted it into the ESPL data standard so that it's more readily usable by the genetic design automation tools within this community. In order to share the information about this uh, iGEM registry, we've created another data repository that we call SimBioHub. This is a joint effort with Neil Whippet, who some of you may have met during the short poll um, description, uh, discussion earlier this morning from Newcastle University, as well as um, my team at the University of Utah. Um, the first version was released um, just going on three years ago. And within the iGEM, or within the SymbioHub data repository, you can find things like the iGEM parts registry. You can find collections of the distributions of parts that uh, normally are sent out to the iGEM competitors and other useful information. And the SymbioHub data repository is actually many data repositories. They have different data repositories storing um, different sorts of genetic information um, at different research groups around the world. The second group of tools that I wanna tell you about are sequence editors. And so one of the um, very nice sequence editors that's out there is the Genius Sequence Editor um, that is available to all iGEM students. You are able to get a free uh, Genius Prime license for your research team to use this to do your sequence editing uh, for your designs. And so this has, these tool has things like sequence analysis and genomics, molecular cloning and primer design, and means to do data management and collaboration. Another very useful sequence editor that's available to iGEM students is SnapGene. SnapGene is a molecular cloning tool um, that allows you to do DNA manipulations, uh, alert you for errors, and steps you through your entire genetic design. And once again, you can get free SnapGene licenses for your team. And so there's a lot of different useful features for, especially for visualizing your genetic designs within the SnapGene tool. A third sequence editor that some of you may find useful is called Benchling. And so Benchling is also available to those that are doing uh, work in the iGEM competition. And so any academic or uh, research activities are free for people to use and create accounts on Benchling for doing DNA sequence editing. One thing that's um, useful about Benchling is we've also coordinated and connected the Benchling tool to SymbioHub so you can exchange designs from your Benchling repository within the SymbioHub repository. So these sequence editors, as you saw, were all at the very low level, basically um, examining and manipulating AGCTs. In the ESPL community, we've developed a couple of other sequence editors that allow you to edit things at a higher level of abstraction. You can basically um, describe your designs as collections of parts and components, such as this design, which is showing a couple promoters and a ribosome binding site, a coding sequence and a terminator constructed together to build a transcriptional unit. Um, this is using a tool called ESPL Designer, uh, which is developed in my research group at the University of Utah. And I'll show a demonstration of that a bit later. A more recent development within our research group is a tool called ESPL Canvas, which also allows you to do DNA level design 
But on top of that, you can also do designs that include things like proteins and interactions um, between these uh, different genetic components. And so I'll be showing a demonstration a bit that a bit of that later. And then finally, the last category of tools I wanted to talk about are the circuit um, design tools or uh, circuit genetic design automation tools. One of the more famous examples is the Cello tool. This was developed out of MIT and Boston University. And for those of you in the audience that might be electrical engineers, you'll see that this uh, language here might look familiar to you. This language is describing uh, a circuit that you want to build using the Verilog language, which is a language that's used by digital electronic designers. And so you describe the circuit you want to build, you press the run button, and it mines a whole bunch of information about your genetic design parts, and it puts them together to build your genetic design uh, circuit for you. And it uses part characterization data to improve the likelihood that the circuit will actually work correctly. And this was published in Science about four years ago. And then finally, um, a you have a question. Um, sure. Someone wants to know how the conversion from GenBank or FASTA is made to SBOL. Um, are you looking for parts in the sequences that correspond to components such as RBS, terminators, or promoter regions? Yes, thank you for your question. So um, the GenBank conversion, um, basically it uses the information that is provided in the annotations in the GenBank. So it's not actually inferring from the sequence that there are particular interesting parts in the sequence itself. What it's doing instead is it's using the annotations that were provided by the person who built the GenBank file itself. So the conversion is only as good as the original GenBank uh, data that is provided to you. Um, so if you're building a design, say, in Benchling or Snapgene or Genius, and you export a GenBank file from one of those tools, if you properly annotated your sequence, then the conversion will be of higher quality. All three of those tools, or at least I'm familiar with Snapgene and Genius, have various features to do auto annotation. So if you have a DNA sequence and you import it into Snapgene, it is enabled, it has a auto annotation feature which will examine the sequence against a library of parts and identify where you might find promoters, ribosome binding sites, and coding sequences within that um, DNA sequence. Um, and so we're actually uh, very interested in this activity. One of my graduate students is doing an analysis of the iGEM data set because as you can imagine, the data is very noisy because it's built over um, you know, the course of several summers by various um, iGEM teams. And what we're trying to do is identify the parts to build an annotation library that we can use to do uh, refined annotations of DNA sequences in the future. Essentially, what we're curious to know is that from all of these 30 or 40,000 iGEM records, what are the you know, fundamental parts that people are using within their designs? So there's many challenging aspects here. Um, but it is uh, a very interesting and important uh, field of operation. So thanks for your question. And, and please do not feel shy about asking further questions as we go. I have a tendency to speak very fast. So please definitely interrupt me at any time. Um, so the last genetic design automation tool that I wanted to tell you about is iBioSim um, or the Intelligent Biological Simulator. And this genetic design automation tool allows you to build computational models. So you can build your genetic design using a um, SQL Designer plugin, and then you can ask SimBioHub about um, information about that genetic design, such as the part characterization data that I mentioned that uh, is provided within the Cello library. From that analysis, it'll build you a computational model using a data, data standard called SBML, which stands for the Systems Biology Markup Language. And then once you have this computational model, you can then perform simulations to analyze the data or analyze the model to see, for example, does your, in this case, this is the famous um, genetic repressilator. So you wanna see whether the circuit actually oscillates. Um, and then this has very tight integration within the SimBioHub data repository. So you can upload your genetic design information to that repository and share it with other individuals. And so now I'm going to move over to doing a demonstration. And before I do so, I want to describe the circuit design that I'm gonna demonstrate. So for those of you that are maybe new to the area of synthetic biology, I just wanna explain that one of the first synthetic biology circuits was this circuit known as a genetic toggle switch. And the genetic toggle switch was designed in 2000 and published in Science in that same year. And this circuit, basically what it does is it acts like a circuit where you can turn it on and off like a switch. 
So here's the way it works. It's built out of a DNA sequence composed of two transcriptional units. One of them begins with this PLAC promoter, which trans initiates transcription for the TET R and GFP genes. And then we have the PTET promoter, which initiates transcription for LAC I. And this is all um, expressed on your DNA sequence. LAC-I, when transcription begins at this PTET promoter, it gets transcribed into a messenger RNA for LAC-I. That then finds a ribosome that gets, uh, and this messenger RNA gets translated into the LAC-I protein. The LAC-I protein is interesting because it binds to the PLAC promoter and it represses the PLAC promoter, preventing further transcription downstream of the TET-R and GFP genes. And this is what we call the off state of the um, genetic toggle switch. And we call it the off state because it's not producing GFP, which stands for green fluorescent protein. So in other, in other words, E. coli cells that have the circuit within them will not be glowing green at this moment in time. If you want to turn the switch on, you add a small molecule called IPTG. And when you add that small molecule, it binds to LACI, prevents LACI from repressing the PLAC promoter, and you start getting transcription of the TET-R and GFP genes. Those get translated into the TET-R and GFP proteins. And then the TET-R protein binds to PTET and it represses the transcription of LAC-I. And at that point, you stop getting production of LAC-I, you are getting GFP, all your cells are glowing green. And so we say the switch is on. Now we can flip the switch again if we wanna turn it off by adding another small molecule, ATC which binds to TET-R, which prevents the repression of PTET and allows us to go back to the off state. And so what I'd now like to do is to demonstrate how we can build a genetic design for this toggle switch. And, and for those of you that um, are like me, electrical engineers in the room, what you should have seen in your head was this cross-coupled NOR gate, which is really known to us as the set reset latch. Okay, so now I'm gonna go and show you how you can do this design. So let's go over here and we're gonna go over to uh, the SymBioHub data repository. And I am going to um, start log out here. And when you come to the SymBioHub data repository, the first thing you're gonna wanna do is get an account. So you're gonna say, I need an account. And uh, it seems the little bit of a lag in the cursor with this uh, program running. So I, I'm gonna sign up and I'm gonna say, I am an iGEM student or put your name here. I'm with the University of iGEM. My email address is iGEM at iGEM.org. Um, my username is gonna be iGEM and I'm gonna put in a password. And so now I've registered for an account. Uh, I think I can remember that password. Sorry, for some reason the mouse is very slow in responding. Um, okay, so now I've created an account and I'm gonna want to create a shopping cart, if you will, for the parts that I'm gonna use in my toggle switch design. So I'm gonna create a um, oops. So, I don't, so the admin folk, I don't know if you've noticed time lags and the, my cursor seems to be very slow. So I'm creating a shopping cart for my parts and I'm going to create a, this collection I'm pressing the submit button here. Okay, so now I wanna put some parts into here. So one of the things I'm gonna need, if we go back and look at my um, slides, I need the PLAC promoter. So let's look for that. So I need a PLAC promoter. And now, as I said, this is using the iGEM data set that we translated into ASPL and deposited in SymbioHub. And so I found um, what looks like a PLAC promoter. And so I can scroll down and get more information like the DNA sequence. If I'm curious, I can also look at um, uh, the iGEM information on the iGEM pages for this. So uh, some, so here's some experience people have had. And so this is actually from the wiki entries that you have on the iGEM registry. Okay, so that looks good to me. So I want to put that into my cart. So I can get my cursor to behave. And 
Let's take that over in my part cart. Okay, so I've stored that away. I also am going to need some ribosome binding sites. So let's go shopping for some ribosome binding sites. Um, so let's take this one maybe. This is one of the more famous ones. One thing that it's doing is it's actually sorting those search results using similar techniques that Google uses to try to sort them by things that are going to be more relevant and to your search query, as well as more likely to be useful. And that's usually calculated by looking at how often has this part been used. And this, this ribosome binding site, for example, has been used quite a lot. So let's um, stick that one into our part cart. And I want to have a little bit of variety to my ribosome binding sites. So I'm going to get another one. Question? How are the names of the parts determined? Is there a specific syntax? Oh, so the names of the parts are the parts names that were given by the, um, the students who uploaded the parts to the iGEM registry. So there is, um, there's a special um, identifiers that you use in the iGEM registry. Uh, there's BBA numbers that groups are assigned. So that gives you those IDs. Um, people can also provide more useful identifying names, um, such as the, um, that makes it easier to, to find these parts. But that's again up to the students when they upload it to the, to the registry. So there isn't a prescribed syntax for the names. Uh, there is for the identifiers, which is prescribed by the iGEM competition, but there isn't for um, other things. So maybe while this is uh, trying to wake up, I'm going to show another um, yeah, definitely my cursor is not wanting to behave. Okay, so I did this search for the genetic toggle switch and I and this is another data repository that's just of papers. And so this is showing uh, various papers that have actually mentioned genetic toggle switches in them. And so this is another SymbioHub registry that's, that's storing this paper information. And um, so since that seems to be having a time lag, what I might do instead is shift over to this video preparation instead. So I'll show you this one instead. Um, so this uh, basically is showing a demonstration of a giant design. Um, and so is everyone seen this movie? Okay, so this is the part page for um, one of these uh, parts from the iGEM registry. And you can see this is the part information that students have uploaded on the wiki for the iGEM registry for this um, genetic receiver part. And so this is a, another SynBioHub. This is with the Living Computing Project. This one stores the information about the cello parts that I described in my presentation. And so, for example, here is one of the genetic um, uh, coding sequences for the MTR protein. This is another tool, sequence editing tool called ESPL Designer that um, basically it's connecting to SymbioHub and it's allowing me to fetch genetic part information. So here's all of the, these genetic gates. And so I've annotated it with this genetic gate. And I'm saving that. And now I want to build a computational model for this circuit. It's composed of several of these transcriptional units. So I'm asking for it to build me a model. And so then this is a particular circuit from that paper called the 0x8e circuit. So I'm building a computational model of that. And I'm fetching from SynBioHub all of this part information. And so in SymbioHub, they actually have data like various uh, on and off rates, uh, the maximum and the minimum uh, flux of this part um, using units called relative promoter units. These were all measured out of Chris Voigt's lab at MIT. When you're looking at a part, you can say, well, where was this part used? And it was used, for example, in this interaction to produce this protein. Um, so this uh, coding sequence codes for the AMTR protein. It's used. Um, to repress this promoter. And so this is repressing this AMTR promoter. And so now it's actually mining all that information to try to build a computational model. So it's, it's finding all of the various interactions, all of those various parameters, 
building a biochemical model composed of species and chemical reactions that you can then simulate using various techniques. And so it's finished building that model. And so here's an example of one circuit in the model. So this is a transcriptional unit that's repressed by a protein and it's activated by a small molecule and it produces the MTR protein. And we've got circuits for each of these transcriptional unit gates. And then, um, so there's one, two, three, four, five of these gates that this circuit's built out of. And this was one of these circuits from the cello science paper that was as published and these circuits were all built and demonstrated to be functional. And so this is the composition of all of those circuits together. And I'm gonna do a simulation of that model. And to do that, I'm adding the circuit here into my um, uh, design that I'm going to stimulate now with a simulation environment. So I'm going to, this is pretending like you're in the lab and you're applying the different small molecules and looking at what the um, circuit is doing by visualizing uh, its response in the form of yellow fluorescent protein or YFP. So I'm connecting this to the YFP and then this little thing on the left is gonna change each of the various inputs combinations and step through all the different um, small molecules you can apply to the circuit. So you can do various types of simulation. I'm doing an ODE simulation and here's the result of that ODE simulation of this logic gate. It's stepping through different input combinations and it is um, generated a simulation result. You can kind of look at that and see, was that what you wanted to see? Was that the circuit behavior you wanted to see? When you're all done, you could send, uh, share this with somebody else by sending it to a SimBioHub. So we're uploading this to a SimBioHub and we're describing um, all of this uh, simulation information and gonna upload it all uh, to share. And so this is my uh, circuit 0x8e model. Uh, so this is my simulation of this circuit. Um, you can add in a, a PubMed ID. So I'm adding in the PubMed ID for the cello science paper. I'm uploading that now to SimBioHub. And then when you go over to SimBioHub, you can um, see that indeed uh, that that uh, information has been uploaded. So it's refreshing that. And so that uh, model has been uploaded. And then here's the simulation plot. You can see the citation down at the bottom that was uh, found for that particular PubMed ID for this particular circuit. And so this is finding, um, this is uploaded this entire uh, genetic circuit design um, and long, along with the, the model and the simulation results. And so this is showing, there's the simulation plot that you'd seen in the simulating tool, iBioSim. Um, it's also annotated this design with how the simulation was generated. That way it's reproducible. So other people can reproduce my simulation to see if indeed it's, um, I can do the same simulation on my own tool rather than having to um, just trust the word of the person who gave me the plot. Like when you're reading a paper, you often see a plot and you wonder if it's correct and you wanna see it simulated in your own environment. So there's information here, like it was built using iBioSim. There's instructions for how doing the simulation. That's this thing called the plan. It's um, also including um, the environment model and all the models that were used to build that simulation of that genetic circuit. And so this is the, uh, the environment that stimulated all the different inputs. Um, this is the uh, circuit design that we actually simulated, the 0xe circuit. And um, <clears throat> this describes all of the various compositions of the different parts uh, put together to build that circuit. And so this is the circuit design. And then I might want to look at some of the modules. And so here are all the various gates that were part of that circuit design. So here's one particular uh, design, and I want to look at one particular circuit in that design, the, AM, the one that produces the MTR protein. And so here's a visualization of that circuit. Um, it's composed of two promoters in this um, transcriptional unit. I'm then going to send it over to the Benchling uh, tool that I mentioned in my talk for doing um, assembly planning. So I can copy it over to the Benchling tool, and then you can jump over and see it within the sequence editing tool Benchling. And so I've copied that design over to Benchling. 
And then you might do some additional sequence level editing. So maybe, for example, I want to change the name of this promoter um, to my promoter, save the annotation, and that immediately gets updated back. Uh, so if you refresh this page, you see that um, it's changed that name to my promoter. Um, so let's see where we're at with this other one. So, um, okay, so this seems to be behaving again. So let me save off. Uh, so let's go going back in the last minutes here to do the toggle switch design again. So hopefully, ah, sorry, my cursor still is misbehaving. So we're going to add that to the collection. If I can get my mouse to behave. Okay, and continuing on, I need another ribosome binding site. So let's take this one. Add that to my part cart. Okay, remind people what I was doing here. I'm trying to build this circuit, so I need to get um, tet r. So here's the tet r coding sequence. So let's store that for further use. I need uh, a green fluorescent protein. So I think this is a good one. So let's stick that in our shopping cart. And now we need to go on to the second one. I'm going to need PTET. Oh, I also need a couple of term terminators. Let's not forget the terminators. And I need PTET and LACI. So let's find us some terminators. So here's a terminator. This is one of the more famous ones. And maybe we'll grab another terminator for the other circuit, just to be different. And then the last bit I need is, I need PTET and LACI. Cursor really does not want to behave. So there we go. PTET. And the last thing I need is the black eye gene. And so I think this is the one I want. Normally, you'd probably open several pages and try to find the one that you're really looking for. But I know what I'm looking for. So I've going to add that one um, to my cart. All right, so now I've, I've built up my list of parts and I want to go build a genetic design for this uh, toggle switch. And I'm going to do that using uh, this Espel Canvas tool. So this is at espelcanvas.org. Um, this is very new. This is a tool that was developed by a senior project team at the University of Utah. Um, so it's still got a few warts to be worked out, um, but we're quite excited about uh, this tool. So um, I'm building up my genetic design like so. Um, this one, is this first circuit here that has two coding sequences. And the tool's much easier to use when your cursor wants to behave. All right, so then I want to also build another um, transcriptional unit. Okay, good enough. And so that's for this other part. Like so. And then I want to also indicate that there are a couple interesting proteins. So there's this one. 
and this one. And maybe for good measure, we can put in the GFP as well. Then I want to have to indicate that this coding sequence codes for this protein. So I can add an edge like so. And um, then I want to say that this coding sequence, or sorry, this protein represses, oops, this protein represses this promoter, like so. Uh, this coding sequence codes for GFP. Oops. <laughs> this really is taking over my machine. Got a mind of its own. And let's do this one. This one represses that promoter, like so. Okay, so now maybe we might want to look, make it look a little bit prettier. So we can start with this gene, for example. And um, actually, I want to do the fill on this. I can color it up nicely. So this coding sequence, I'll use this color. Um, so I'll color the, the arrow with the same. Someone is asking, can SQL Canvas provide specific information about the proteins and connections of the circuit if they are imported, or does the user uh, specify each interaction? Right. So um, right now, uh, the interactions are not being inferred. I had to provide them in this in the editor, but in the future, we could imagine that they could be inferred, much like I did in the other demo video that I showed you. So given um, the fact that this is a little tricky with the cursor, I'm going to go uh, and fill in the rest of the details about the sequence. So, so far, this is, is completely independent of sequence. There hasn't been any sequence specified yet. But now I want to go to that um, part cart that I had built and find the sequences for these things to uh, annotate them from SymbioHub. So I can go here now, and I can um, find go to SymbioHub and I want to log in to this account that we've created. And then I want to find that collection of parts that I had created. And here I need to have the PLAC promoter, as you see. So I'm going to download that part. So now you can see here's the DNA sequence for that part. This is the part that we found in SymbioHub, and it's filled in all the other entries about its name, description, et cetera. And so I can do that for each of these individual parts. And so let's grab one of these ribosome binding sites. Maybe while I'm there, I'll make it colorful. So this time I need the TED R coding sequence, <clears throat> so I can download that one. 
and so you can see you've got the coding sequence uh, sequence uh, annotated there. Maybe I want to make that one, let's say, blue. Normally this is smoother when the cursor wants to behave. Is there a reason for choosing three different RBS parts? Sorry, you got cut off there. What was the... For choosing three different RBS parts? Sorry, what was the question? Is there a reason for choosing three different RBS parts? Uh, not really. Not really. I was just being different. Um, there's no biological reason for doing that. Um, so it's just just to be, I was just doing it for variety in this demo. Um, so somehow I think my cursor picked this up and moved it over. So um, anyway, since I think you get the idea, you can carry on and fill in the rest of them. And then when you're all done, you can save this back to SymbioHub. And so I can put it, for example, back in into my part collection and give it a name. And if I go back to SymbioHub, ah, sorry. And go into my part collection. We should find now I have this toggle switch that I've built. And so that's the toggle switch I built. And if you're curious, like I want to know more about the GFP, you can click on that and it'll take you to the page about the GFP um, part of your design. So um, I think that basically concludes my demo. Um, I'm happy to stay around and answer further questions. Um, I'm also uh, very happy to answer questions by email if you want to try to reach out. Um, I'm uh, myers at ec.utah.edu. You can find that find me online. And if any of you are interested in learning more or using any of these uh, tools, um, let me know. You're all very welcome. Thanks. Yeah, so to find out if the part works, you'd want to build a simulation of it. So there's a couple of different ways you might do that. So there was the one that you saw in the movie that you could do that by um, mining the part information, but, but the information needs to be fairly complete to do that. So it's really, it's kind of like the old thing, it's garbage in, garbage out. So if there's a lot of details about it, you you would be able to build those type of models like uh, you could with cello designs. With iGEM, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of details about how the parts interact with each other. Those have not been traditionally captured in the parts registry. Uh, there'd be something really cool to add that information to parts so that you could do computational models more efficiently. Of course, one can always build a computational model themselves if you have some understanding of the design that you're working on. And if anyone has any other questions, um, does the simulation work with only? No, not necessarily. So the um, for the particular uh, model generation stuff that I showed in the video, um, we have part libraries from, from yeast and from uh, one or two other organisms, as well as plasma-based E. coli and genome integrated. And so, if as long as you have models, uh, as long as you have information about the parts, it doesn't have to be just E. coli. The iGEM competition traditionally has been more about E. coli, so most of the iGEM data comes from E. coli, though there are a smattering of parts from other organisms. In terms of auto modeling, 
Uh, so again, so again, that depends upon the information. So the question is, they're asking about what, what if you have a part that re interacts with multiple promoters or represses multiple promoters? So presumably, all that information would again need to be captured in the database. So you'd need to say which proteins interact with each promoter. And ideally, you also indicate the strength of that interaction with part um, characterization data. So you know something about the various strengths of those. Uh, but definitely these um, multiple interactions, if they're important, can influence the likelihood of your design working. So it's important to have that kind of information available. Um, a pro so if a protein enzyme is discovered recently and only it's available, Right, so if, if something's been discovered very recently, it may not be in the iGEM part registry. So um, you can always upload your own parts. You don't have to use the ones in the part registry. So if you are interested in a novel part that's never been used before, in fact, that's one of the various aspects about the iGEM competition is a desire to create new parts, not just reuse all only new old parts. So you can submit your own parts um, if you've built them with another tool um uh, built that information or if you have GenBank or others you can upload that information and then you can use these um your personal design parts as well as the publicly shared parts yes that's correct um and you can reach me by best way to reach me is by email um so i'm currently with the university of utah and you can find my website there, um, my email is myers at ece.utah.edu. Um, you can also, um, I'll just to let you know, I'll be moving to, to University of Colorado Boulder later this summer and uh, look forward to actually working with the IGEM team from Boulder in the future. Um, but I will always be uh, findable online, so you can definitely find me if you look up probably any of the words, if you remember any of the words like SymbioHub or others, you can look it up. Yes, thanks, Lucas, for sharing that. Um, You're very welcome. And and that's another good point is if any of you try out these tools, these are very, very much in development. So there's issue trackers for all the tools. So feel free to add issues to the issue trackers and we'll do our best to try to fix them. As I mentioned, SBOL Canvas is one of our newest tools. And so it still has a few um, glitches to work out before it's um, thoroughly ready for um, wide public use, but, but hopefully some of you will try it out and give us your feedback. Yeah, so once you've built it in SBOL Canvas and up uploaded to SymbioHub, you can uh, download that sequence information into an iBiosyn project as well to use it. Um, as I mentioned before, though, um, to do the auto model generation stuff that I demoed in the video, that's not going to work with the iGEM registry parts because the data is just not available for all those parts that's necessary. It's only the Cello uh, library that uh, the Cello libraries that have that kind of characterization data. But you can annotate a model with your sequences so that you know I built this model for this DNA design, and you can stitch that information together. There's actually a nice video showing uh, how to do that on our iBiosyn. Uh, demo page. Um, right, so that's a, a private parts. Yes, so that's a really unique feature, I think, of the Simpile registry versus like, like iGEM is when you submit a part, it's not publicly visible. When you submit a part to the iGEM registry, it's put into your own private registry of parts, so only you can see it. You can, though, generate share links like you can with Google Docs to share it with other people if you want others to look at it and give you comments on it. Um, but only once you've made it published, once you've published it, it is available to others. Um, as far as what additional information is needed for simulation, you need to know, for example, which coding sequences code for which proteins, which proteins repress which promoters. Basically, you need all of this interactions uh, encoded. In addition to that, um, you need to have, you, that will get Get you a model that you could simulate. It's just going to use um, generic parameters, so it'll give you a rough idea, and that might be good enough for some things. Um, what the Cello team does, though, is they go a step further and they actually characterize all their parts through careful lab measurements. So um, I point you to the Cello science paper, and particularly 
their uh, supplemental document that describes in quite a lot of detail how they actually did their characterization experiments. And so um, you'd, it's quite a, I mean, it's quite a process to do and it's quite an undertaking when, they, when they've done it in the past, but it's well described. So if you're interested in characterizing parts, you can build better models. Um, it's a very um, nice way about going about it. But I would say that's one of the, the open areas. Um, maybe the measurement committee or others might have more to say about how that should be done in the future, um, but better understanding how we want to characterize parts so we have good data sheets in a very standard form is still an area where there's still a lot of debate. Uh, so the SBOL canvas, um, I guess in theory, you can build um, chemical reaction networks, but it's more tuned to genetic circuits right now. Most of its features are around that aspect of design. If you want to simulate a metabolic pathway, um, that's more a chemical reaction network, and I'd recommend um, using iBioSim, or there's other modeling tools. I think they may have sessions, I'm not sure. Um, tools like Copasi and, and um, Roadrunner and some other simulation tools. I'd point you to the sbml.org, uh, which has a nice list of biomodeling tools that you might consider if you wanna do modeling experiments. Um, of course, you can use MATLAB as well, but there's a lot of very nice tools out there that allow you to um, build things using more of a GUI editor and other sort of easier to design uh, model approaches. You're very welcome. So once again, if there are no other questions, um, thank you for attending. Um, yeah, CAP is very nice too. That's, yeah, thanks for the recommendation. Uh, that's for doing rule-based modeling. If you're interested in things like signal transduction networks, it's a really nice tool for that. Um, there's another one that does a sim that's similar to CAPA called BioNetGen. Um, that's also worth having a look at because certainly uh, modeling, I think, is something that, that you're all going to want to be thinking about since um, lab access is quite limited this year, of course. Um, so that's that's a good question. That's a more um, biology question, I guess. I'm not entirely. I mean, it, it depends on what you're trying to do, um, and uh, and thank you, Marcus. Uh, and so um, you're very welcome. And so I, I sometimes metabolic networks have um, genetic networks sort of interconnected with them. Um, Sometimes the modeling aspects that interconnect them is a little bit challenging because they genetic circuits and metabolic circuits tend to be simulated and, and modeled in slightly different ways. But there's been a lot of very interesting work um, in doing modeling there. Uh, one area you might look at is flux balance analysis. Um, and they there's a number of tools and methods uh, that are used to do that kind of analysis for metabolic systems. And many of those flux balance analysis tools do incorporate genetic effects. So if you have a genetic circuit that's controlling the metabolic network, uh, there's ways of, of representing that. Um, the COBRA um, project is probably a good one to look at for that. Yes, thanks. There's, there are good multicellular modeling project teams out there so, uh, that are also very useful. Thank you, you're very welcome too. Thanks for attending.